room to ransom this year's Rebecca Chisholm Clark speaker, Don Wright.
who are skeptics. Pi tells them this incredible story, they listen to it attentively, they each have a little break because they're quite exhausted. They come back and they say the classic words of skeptics, I don't believe you. And Pi is a bit surprised anyone who suffered uh, wants his or her suffering accepted. And here his suffering is not being accepted, he's being told that essentially he's a liar. And so in the book, uh, not in the movie, but in the book, there was this long interrogation in which the two skeptics and Pi sort of duel over what happened out there. And essentially, the investigators only want to find out why the ship sank. That's their only concern. They're sort of bureaucrats who want to find out why the ship sank. And since Pi has no idea, he was just a spectator on that ship, he just happened to get up in the middle of the night, in the middle of the storm, he happened to be on the deck. And because of that, he survived, whereas his entire family and everything else from his life, not only his family, but all the animals he knew as a child growing up, and his, all his material goods, which is not to be neglected as a source of happiness. Everything essentially he's ever, ever known vanishes. And he had the luck of being on the deck and managing to end up on this lifeboat. So he tells them the story, uh, they reject it, and they're about to go. So he, but just before they leave, he says to them, wait a second, you, you don't believe me, do you? They say, no, you don't. He says, well, you want me to tell you another story? And they say, well, we actually want to know what happens. He says, well, essentially you want another story. Let me tell you another story. And um, there follows a very compressed story, a very compressed alternate story of what might have happened at sea, in which instead of there being um, four animals, there are four human survivors. There is I, there is his mother, there is a French cook, a French cook on the ship, and a Taiwanese sailor. And the conventions of old literature impose themselves, whereby you know, man's inhumanity to man is the old way of putting it. Those classic rules apply themselves. Things get brutish, and eventually there's only one human survivor, Pi and he reaches the coast of Mexico. So Pi tells this alternate story, which, once again, does not explain the, sin the sinking of the ship. Pi has no idea why the ship sank. That is a mystery that is never explained in the book, and that was deliberate on my part. Because as you will know when you, when, you, when you go on in life, there are tragedies that rip through lives that are inexplicable, whether it's car accidents, plane accidents, uh, disease, acts of warfare, um, they are beyond satisfactory explanation. So that's a tragedy that I never explain, and that Pi can never explain as to why the ship sank. Was it a storm? Was it structural weakness in the, in the ship? Was it an accident? Was it an old mine from the Second World War? Who knows? He cannot explain that. Neither story explains the sinking of the ship. So the investigators aren't any happier with the second story. They're about to leave. And just before they leave, Pi says, wait, I have one question for you, one last question. And the question is, which is the better story? He doesn't ask which is the true story, because after all, they can't tell which is the true story. He says, you can't tell which is the true story, because you weren't there. Either story, both stories, have to be taken on faith. Both stories have as their only reporter the only teller of the tale is Pi. So the truth can't be established. And so he asks them, which is the better story? Which is the better story? And uh, Pi asks him that question, and the younger of the two investigators me, he says, well, the story with animals. The story with animals is the better story. And then Pi responds with this very cryptic line, uh, thank you, and so it goes with God. Has a bit of a breakdown, and the investigators leave. And that's the end of the story. There's one more chapter in which the investigators, uh, it's an extract of the report that they submitted, in which they basically say, we cannot explain the sinking of the ship. We don't know what happened out there. there are, there's no little magic black box, and uh, we can't understand it. it. It shouldn't have sunk, but it did. There's no explanation. And as an aside, the story of the one single survivor is an astonishing story. And we've never heard of anyone surviving 227 days at sea. And even less so with the tiger. So at the very end, in their report, they accept um, I's uh, first story, story with animals. 
So hopefully most of you recognize that story. Yes, yes, yes. In the movie, um, I'll address the movie. Uh, I, just, I hope most of you have read the book, I imagine in the movie, I imagine you have that classic response that both the book is dead. I think that's usually the case because the book has a lot in it. I mean, Black Pie is 354 pages. There's a lot of rumination that can take place over the course of 354 pages. A lot of thinking, a lot of suggesting, a lot of dialogue between my imagination and your imagination. Um, a lot of thinking. And thinking is wonderful, but it's not particularly visual. Cinema, obviously, is primarily exclusively, not primarily, primarily, just sound too, is primarily visual. And you can't visualize ideas. You can have someone thinking, but you can't really convey what they are thinking, um, unless the character directly addresses the camera and starts speaking in paragraphs, which usually is as gripping as, you know, action. So, the movie doesn't have all the, th the thought process that the book has, but it essentially captures that. Um, you know, you have the two stories, I found in the movie, and I'll see what you think, I found in the movie that the second story was sort of tacked on, sort of came out of nowhere. I recite the second story in his hospital bed. It doesn't quite have the weight that it does in the book. And you mainly don't have all the argumentation between the investigators and between Pi for what happened out there. Um, but it was, I found, uh, visually a ravishing movie. I just loved all the scenes in the Pacific. I thought that the Angie did a very successful job there. Um, if you're interested in the making of the movie, the, um, it is a mixture of live action and CGI, computer graphics. And there were four tigers used, four live tigers used in the film notes. Um, three from France, one from Canada. And each was used in a different part of the movie. Um, you know, the one that had the most handsome face was the one you saw when there was a, when there was a, a headshot of the tiger needed. One was used for the side, the back, whatever. They used whatever type was useful for any particular scene. But in many scenes, it was a computer-generated type. Um, so for example, one thing that they could get a live tiger to do was to jump off a, life, a lifeboat. Tigers are very, very good swimmers. And so there's a shot, if you remember in the movie, there is one shot when the tiger jumps off the boat and starts swimming about the Pacific. That was a live tiger, that was a real tiger. And right afterwards there's a shot from underwater of the tiger swimming at the surface of the ocean. That's also a live tiger. What they couldn't get the tiger to do though, was to climb back aboard the lifeboat. <laughs> they could get it to do that, but not on command. And of course cinema, you know, it's a whole operation. And an actor can be told what to do, he or she'll do it on prompt. A tiger will not necessarily, and if the tiger gets stressed, he'll do it even less and he gets more dangerous. So they could get it, but not when they wanted to, and all the conditions were right, the lighting, the water, etc. So the tiger that climbs aboard the lifeboat is a, is a CGI one. And one of the most surprising, if you remember those seen the movie, early on in the movie, when Pi and his older brother go behind the cages and meet the new tiger in the zoo. There's a scene where there's a long corridor, sort of like this one right in front of me, and the new tiger sort of comes in from the, uh, from, uh, you know, where you'll see him. He turns the corner and he comes straight towards us. He comes straight towards the camera. It's a very static scene. He just sort of walks very slowly and freezes and looks. And when I first saw the movie, I assume, well, that for sure is going to be a live tiger. This is not a very difficult scene. You just have the tiger come up, freeze, and look. So I assume it was, a, it was a live tiger. All the more so because it is so static. You have several, several seconds to look very closely at that tiger. Well, it wasn't. That is a CGI tiger. Completely fabricated by a bunch of people on computers. Um, so the movie I thought was astonishing in terms of its realism. And that was done with a lot of hard work and a lot of money. It was, I thought, the movie I thought was weak in its storytelling. I thought it sort of limped a bit to, towards the end. I said, oh, the second story was uh, tacked on. 
and it's sort of linked. And also, he did a few classic things that Hollywood movies want to make. One thing that I did do in the movie, in the book, very deliberately so, is I never anthropomorphize the title. In other words, I never give the title of human characteristics. In the life of Pi, for example, the tiger doesn't talk. He doesn't you know, play cards. Um, <laughs> He's a real live tiger who growls and is very dangerous and has his own understanding of life. Uh, in the movie, um, and when he wanted to, you know, did sort of humanize the tiger more. There's one scene in the movie that is radically not there in the book, which, if you remember, uh, things go badly for the two of them, for the tiger and the uh, pie. In the book, there is a scene when they're practically on the edge of death, and very briefly, Pi touches the tiger. It is the only time he touches him. The tiger is practically dead. There's been rain. He just touches his fur. He just touches him very briefly. Which I suggest you never do in real life, because the tiger will rip you apart. In the movie, when they are in extremis and about to die, Pi, if you'll remember the scene in the movie, Pi sits right next to the tiger, lifts his head, and puts his head on his lap. And, you know, you actually could do that to a tiger if it was half an hour or maybe 15 minutes from dying. If it's so, so weak that it cannot defend itself, then it would allow a complete odd-smelling, odd-looking foreign entity to touch it. But otherwise, it would do everything to defend itself. So that was sort of a classic Hollywood attempt to sort of humanize the tiger and create a, a, a moment. It didn't particularly work for me, but obviously I wrote the book on it. It's not what I put in the book. Some of you, you know, to see if you found that an effective scene. Um, let me speak a little bit briefly about the process of adaptation of a book to a movie, to the screen. That happens all the time in Hollywood, of course. Hollywood is always looking for stories. We're all looking for stories. Uh, personal stories, family stories, national stories, and Hollywood's looking for movie stories. So it happens all the time that Hollywood buys books. They buy them for not very much money, and they sit on the shelf, and most of them that's where they spend the rest of their lives, because actually very few movies are produced. Because the movie is fabulously expensive to make. For example, Life of Pi costs $120 million. You don't just come up with $120 million. You need a lot of investors, they don't want to lose their money. You have all these nearly impossible commercial pressures put on people who make movies. Hollywood is run by people who are mostly under 40, who are this far apart from having a nervous breakdown. Because they're so stressed. Um, so it's very hard to make movies. So they buy a lot of books and they just sit there. And the rare one has the good fortune of being made. Um, Life of Pi was one of those. I was quite puzzled. Hollywood bought the, the book very, very soon after it was published. I think before it was published, they were interested. And they, they bought it. And when, they, when a studio buys a book, it's like when, well, not you, but later on, when you buy your hybrid electric car, when you buy your own car, you can do what you want with it. You can drive off the lot and drive it into a tree if you want. You can use your car. You can drive your personal property. When a studio buys a book, it's exactly the same thing. They can buy your book and do anything they want with it. Absolutely anything. They could have turned this into a movie about a Mongolian circus moving to America and having circus problems. They could call it Life of Pi. And they could do anything they want with the content. And the only people who would be outraged would be the author and his or her readers. In this case, the studio was remarkably faithful to the project. Um, despite the simplicity of the story, it is just a boy in the life of the tiger. Uh, as I said, it was it's fabulously extensive to bring that to reality. You can't put, at no point in the movie was an actor actually in the presence of a live tiger. Never. Uh, in the scenes, where you see Pi on the lifeboat with the tiger. Pi, Suraj Sharma, was actually on a lifeboat, on a gimbal, which is a big device that holds up, a, 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 in this case, a lifeboat, it moves it around like it's at sea. He actually was on the lifeboat, but in front of him was a man wearing a blue suit. Entirely blue, because that means it would fade out very easily. And he pretended to be the tiger, so that Suraj could have some entity in front of him to which he could react. And then there were scenes when there was a tiger in the lifeboat, in which case there was no actor on that lifeboat. And off the lifeboat was the highly trained trainer, with a lot of health insurance, trying to get the tiger to do what he should do. 
um, and no one would answer together. Um, uh, I just lost my thought. What was that? What was I missing? That? Uh, what was I missing? What was I missing? I missing the... Oh yeah, how expensive it is to make. So, um, it is fabulously expensive. So I had the luck of a studio pushing for this project. Despite the simplicity of the project, the story was very expensive to make. Right from the start, it was going to require a lot of computer technology. Um, they none of us wanted to do it. They went to a series of directors. Uh, Hollywood is about a thousand people on a tightrope, and if one falls off, it all falls, off, it all falls apart. It requires so many different elements. A director who's available, actors who are available, uh, camera people, uh, a set that's available. Everything has to fall into place for it to happen, and almost often it doesn't. In this case, the studio was determined, and they went through a whole bunch of directors. One issue was M.I. Shyamalan, the man who was sense. I remember that movie and some other ones. He had actually fell to the side. Another one was Alfonso Cuaron, the man who just did Gravity, who won an Oscar last year, just a few months ago. Uh, he fell to the side. Then, for the longest time, there was a man named Jean-Pierre Jeunet, a French director, who did a movie called Amelie. I don't know if you remember that. It's a delightful French movie. He wrote a terrific screenplay for it, he wasn't going to fell to the side. And finally, it's Stan Lee, the wonderful Envy, who, who, who got to the helm of the movie and managed to get it uh, done. My involvement was minimal. It was minimal. I uh, early on read uh, two versions of the screenplay. Um, I thought it was good. I thought it had certain weaknesses, but I figured they'd work it out. I think, I think they only partly worked it out. Um, and that was it. I do have a brief cameo. I don't suppose any of you recognize me, but I am like the pie. There is, if you remember, there's a scene in Montreal. If you remember the book, it's set in Toronto, but no one was interested in filming in Toronto. They all wanted to film in Montreal. Um, there's a brief scene where Adolf Pye and the writer are sitting on a bench in front of a pond. And the camera at one point is behind them, so the backs of the, the backs of them while they're talking. Well, across the pond, there's some guy sitting on a bench. <laughs> in a very quote writerly. Well, that's me. I'm just going to do that. I just have a tiny cameo. Um, that was the extent of my involvement. Uh, I was otherwise not involved, and with good reason, because the you'll see this um, if you read books that have been adapted to the screen. The language of cinema and the language of books is very, very different. Um, as the cliche goes, you know, a picture will paint a thousand words. Um, in the book, it took me pages, in a sense, to establish what the tiger looks like, to establish the credibility of the tiger being on the lifeboat with Pi. Well, in a movie, as soon as you see Pi on a lifeboat with a tiger, that credibility is established because you see what you believe. Sorry, you believe what you see. You see them on the there, you see it visually, there you go, you believe. So what took pages of my book was established in a second in the movie. Also, words are wonderful at describing emotions. I'm sad. I love you, I hate you, I'm scared. It's very good at describing emotions, it's very good at describing thoughts. It's, to a limited extent, good at describing action. It's fairly poor at describing things. To describe, for example, a face, to describe a face with words is nearly impossible. Unless you use exaggeration, you know, enormous lips, uh, very broad nose, pink hair, then you get a hazy idea. If it's a normal human face, words cannot operate like a camera. A camera instantly identifies a face. Words can't. So in the book, the storm, there's a storm that sinks and sinks in the ship. I go over that fairly quickly. Why? Because first of all, I figure you can just imagine what it's like for the ship to sink. It's just tossing and turning and actually sinking. And it will take me forever to try to make it sound vivid, and it's what counts for me is what happens afterward, is the effect of the sinking of that ship on Pi. That's what really counts for me. So in the book, the sinking of the ship is essentially described in three words. The ship sank. That's it. I say a few more things, it may sound like a monstrous metallic verb. But that's essentially it. I quickly move on to its effect on Pi. For the movie, that's completely different. For them, the sinking of the ship is a godsend because it's visually charismatic. 
And sure enough, in the movie, it's a very dynamic scene. You know, you have these swells, you have the ship coming up and crashing down, you have this water splash, and you have the alarm, you have these animals running on board. What was, to, what was you know, one sentence in the book becomes several minutes in the movie. And conversely, all the religious rumination, all the philosophizing in the book, which takes pages and pages and things at the heart of it, barely appears in the movie, because that they can't visualize. So in the translating of a book to the screen, there's this odd process of compression and expansion. Some things in the book are compressed, other things are expanded. So, that's not the language I speak. I don't speak the language of cinema. I love cinema. I grew up on it, like most people. Movies are amazing. But it's not the art form I'm familiar with. I'm comfortable with prose. I'm comfortable with you know, paragraph after paragraph after paragraph. I don't know the dramatic working out of a movie. So I took a step back and just trusted that it would work out. And I think it is, as I said, a, a reasonable job. Now, let me just read, because um, Caleb, I should just get a little bit of your time. Caleb, I think, is everyone seems to come to I'll read from the author's note. This book was born as I was hungry. Let me explain. In the spring of 1996, my second book, a novel, came out in Canada. It didn't fare well. Reviewers were puzzled, but down it with faint praise. Then readers ignored it. Despite my best efforts at playing the clown or the trapeze artist, the media circus made no difference. The book did not move. Books lined the shelves of bookstores like kids standing in a row to play baseball or soccer. And mine is the gangly, unathletic kid that no one wanted on their team. My book vanished quickly and quietly. The fiasco did not affect me too much. I had already moved on to another story, a novel set in Portugal in 1939. Only, I was feeling restless, and I had a little money. So I flew to Bombay. This is not so illogical if you realize the <coughs> things, that a stint in India will beat the restlessness out of any living creature. That a little money can go a long way there, and that a novel set in Portugal in 1939 may have very little to do with Portugal in 1939. I had been to India before in the north for five months. On that first trip, I had come to the subcontinent completely unprepared. Actually, I had a preparation of one word. When I told a friend who knew the country well with my travel plans, he said casually, No, they speak a funny English in India. They like words like bamboozle. I remembered his words as my plan as my plane started its descent towards Delhi. So the word bamboozle was my one preparation for the rich noisy, functioning madness of India. I used the word on occasion, which was told, it served me well. To a clerk at the train station, I said, I didn't mean the ferry, so expensive. You're not trying to bamboozle, are you? <laughs> he smiled and said, no, sir, there is no bamboozle here. I quoted you the correct fare. <laughs> the second time in India, I knew better what, I, what to expect, and I knew what I wanted. I would set up on a hill station and write my novel. I had visions of myself sitting at a table on a large veranda, my notes spread out in front of me next to a steam cup of tea. Green hills, heavy with mist, would lie at my feet, and the shrill cries of monkeys filled my ears. The weather would be just right, requiring a light sweater mornings and evenings, and something short speed midday. Thus set up, hand in hand, for the sake of greater truth, I would turn Portugal into a fiction. That's what fiction is about, isn't it? Selective transforming of reality. The twisting of it to bring out its essence. What need did I have to go to Portugal? Unfortunately, the novel sputtered, coughed, and died. It happened in Natran, not far from Bombay, a small hill station with some monkeys but no tea estates. It's a misery peculiar to would be writers. Your theme is good, as are your sentences. Your characters are so ruddy with life, they practically need birth certificates. The plot you've mapped out for them is grand, simple, and gripping. You've done your research, gathering the facts, historical, social, climatic, culinary, that will give your story its feel of authenticity. The dialogue sits along, cracking with tension. The descriptions burst with color, contrast, and telling detail. Really, your novel, your story, can only be great. But it all adds up to nothing. In spite of the obvious shining promise of it, there comes a moment when you realize but the whisper that has been pestering you all along from the back of your mind is keeping the flat, awful truth. Your story won't 
birth. An element is missing, that spark that brings to life a real story, regardless of whether the history of the food is right. Your story is emotionally dead, that's the crux of it. Discovery is something soul-destroying, I tell you. It leaves you with an aching hunger. hunger. From Mataran, I mailed in on this my failed novel. I mailed into a fictitious address in Siberia. The return address equally fictitious in Bolivia. After the clerk stamped the envelope and thrown it into a sorting bin, I sat down, bum, and disheartened. What now, Tolstoy? What are the bright ideas you have for your life? I asked myself. Well, I still had a little money, and I was still feeling restless. I got up and walked out of post office to explore the south of India. I would like to say I'm a doctor for those who ask me what I did, doctors being the current purveyors of magic and miracle. But I'm sure we would have had a bus accident around the next bend, and with all eyes fixed on me, I'd have to explain to Mr. Crying and Moaning Victims that I meant the doctor in the wall. Then to the appeal to help me sue the government for the mishap, I'd have to confess that as a matter of fact, this about is a false. <laughs> Next, the shout of what meaning such a bloody tragedy could have, I'd have to admit that I hardly touched Kierkegaard and so on. I stopped at the humble, bruised truth. Along the way, here and there, I got a response by the answer. Is that so? I have a story for you. Most times, the stories were a little more than anecdotes, short of breath and short of life. I arrived in the town of Pondicherry, a tiny, self-governing Union territory south of Madras. I was at the Indian Coffee House on Nehru Street. It's one big room with green walls and a high ceiling. Fans whirl above you to keep the warm, humid air moving. The place is furnished to capacity with identical square tables, each with its complement of four chairs. You sit where you can whoever is at the table. The coffee is good and they French toast. Conversation is easy to come by. And so, a spry, dry-eyed elderly man with great shocks of pure white hair was talking to me. I confirmed him that Canada was cold and the French was indeed spoken in parts of the like and so on and so forth. The usual light talk between friendly, curious Indians and foreign backpackers. He took, in, he took in my line of work with a widening of the eyes and a nodding of the head. It was time to go. I had my hand up trying to catch my way beside it at the bill. Then the other man said, I have a story that can make you believe in God. I stopped waving my hand. But I was suspicious. This is such a hoax witness, not to make Does your story take place 2,000 years ago in the remote corner of the Roman Empire? I asked. Mm, no. Hmm. He's some sort of Muslim evangelist. Does it take place in 7th century Arabia? No, no. My story starts right here in Pondicherry, just a few years back. And it ends, I'm delighted to study, in the very country you come from. And the you believe in God? Yes. That's a tall order. Not so tall that you can't preach. My waiter appeared. I hesitated for a moment. I ordered two coffees. We introduced ourselves. His name was Francis Adiubasami. Please tell me your story, I said. You must pay proper attention. I will. I brought up again in note that. Tell me, have you been to the botanical garden? He asked. I went yesterday. Did you notice the toy train tracks? Yes, I did. A train still runs on Sundays to the amusement of children. But it used to run twice an hour every day. Did you take note of the names of the stations? One is called Roseville. It's right next to the Rose Garden. That's right. And the other? Mm, I don't remember. Ah, the sign was taken down. The other station was once called Zoo Town. The toy train had two stops, Rosel and Zoo Town. Once upon a time, there was a zoo in the Pondicherry Botanical Garden. <laughs> he went on. I took notes. The elements of the story. You must talk to him, he said, the main character. I knew him very, very well. He's a grown man now. You must ask him all the questions you want. Later, in Toronto, among nine columns of Patels in the phone book, the main character. My heart pounded as I dialed his phone number. The voice of answer had an Indian lilt to its Canadian accent, light but unmistakable, like a trace of incense in the air. That was a very long time ago, he said. Yet he agreed to meet. We met many times. He showed me the diary he kept during the events. He showed me the yellow newspaper clippings that made him briefly, obscurely famous. He told me his story. All the while I took notes. Nearly a year later, after considerable difficulties, I received a tape and a report from the Japanese Ministry of Transport. It was as I listened to that tape 
And I agreed with Mr. Adam Russell that this was indeed a story to make you believe in God. Thank you very much. I've gone too long, sorry. Um, Did you want the readers, like which story did you want the readers to believe in more, like, like the one with the animals or the one with the people? And also, if you were reading the book from like one of our perspectives and not the perspective of the author, which one would you believe? Hmm. Um, that's a good question. Yeah, life implies, to my mind, as the writer, different from your tradition as the reader, of course, is essentially a competition between two stories. In the novel, I offer you two stories, and at the end of it, I offer you the choice of which to believe. I offer the investigators, and therefore the reader, which one to choose. Now, personally, if I were a reader, well, I'd believe the first story with animals, um, rather than the second story without animals. Why? And that goes to the deeper theme of the book, and that line is sort of the story of the God. My belief is that the great mechanism in life, the great engine of life, is some kind of faith. We're not reasonable animals. We're not computers. We have invented rationality, which is a tremendously powerful tool, but it's not essentially in our nature to be strictly logical and rational. This, you know, this microphone is an incredible tool, but I have to have something to say to be using it properly. And to have something to say, to have something to do, it needs some kind of faith. I'm not talking religious faith, I don't care if you guys believe in God or not. Just some kind of faith, whether it's in God, or in someone you love, or in something you love whether it's a person, a cause, a country, a family, some sort of thing has to motivate you. And after that, you can use rationality to make to empower your faith, to make your faith more useful to the world. So if you love someone, then you use rationality. How can I love that person better? If you believe in a cause, like getting rid of Stephen Harper, <laughs> how can I take this and then you see, what can I do to get rid of him? Well, I can try to all different the party young people to vote, stuff like that. You have to have faith before rationality. And in my mind, if you limit yourself to faith, you're unliving your life. There's no point in being 78 years old, dying of cancer in a hospital bed, which will be likely your faith. We ought to die of something in cancer. There's a lot of us out. I think you're probably older than 77, probably in your 90s, excuse me, I don't know if you're nutrition or exercise. But nonetheless, at one point you'll be dying in bed, and I doubt that you will look back at your life and say, I had a good life because I was always producing it. There's nothing to be gained by being excessively reasonable. You don't want to be crazy. You don't want to be some evangelical weirdo or some political fascist or you don't want extremism. But you want to have some sort of belief. You know, is a childhood that believed briefly like I have three children? Do I want my little theos for an act? Do I want them to not believe in Santa Claus? Of course I do. For the brief time you believe that, it's wonderful to believe in Santa Claus. And then I want to believe in other mythical things as he goes up until he starts you know, reading great novels, which are all fictions, that they make your life better. So to my mind, you can't be crazy, but you do want to dream part of your life. Life is a mixture of facts and dream, and it's in that complex mixing that you get what your life will be. It's not just, it can't be reduced to facts. So to me, the first word, with animals, is that you can't prove it. And some things have nothing to do with factual proof. You know, if I asked you, you know, there's a wonderful show on the HBO now. I don't want to go there. Uh, Henry Moore is a fabulous artist, and Francis Bacon, a fabulous, twisted British artist. They're extraordinary artists. You look at one of their great paintings or their great sculpture. If I ask you, is it true? It's a very odd question to ask. Is it true? I don't know, but it's beautiful. And that has its own kind of truth. There's all kinds of truth. Aesthetic truths, psychological truths, emotional truths. Those all quickly go beyond factual truths. And it's mixed together that you get these stories that are either religious or national or family stories that go way beyond the facts. And those are the ones you want to invest yourself in. And to me, that is the first story, the story with animals. It's one that goes beyond mere factuality and creates it's still a tragic story. In both stories, Pi loses his family and suffers tremendously. But in the first story, something is made of that suffering. 
Whereas the second story, it's just an abomination. It's just an act of incredible violence that leaves them with absolutely nothing. So to me, you might as well make more of your life than less. You might as well use rationality as a tool at the, at the, at the work of your, working for your faith, any kind of faith, rather than just standing on some sort of notions of rationality and being some kind of triumph. So I would believe the first story, which is true for us to decide as a reader, so I would prefer the first one because it's more marvelous. Just as I'd rather dance down the street than walk down the street. I'm sure we're down that street. You know, I'd rather have colorful walls than a blind wall. You know, add marvel and magic to your life without it making your life insane, and you'll have a better life. So I definitely prefer the story with you know. Are there any other questions? Was there any symbolism behind your choice of a tiger as one of the main characters? Uh, yes, I... Some writers work, write, work with a great degree of spontaneity. I carefully plan. So everything was planned. Why the ship is finished on seven days, the animals, etc. Initially, which part of the tiger wasn't going to be a tiger. It was, very initially, it was going to be an elephant. Um, but I wasn't pleased with that, because the idea of a lifeboat with a thin little Indian boy at one end and a great elf at the other, <laughs> so lopsided, it was too comic. And I didn't necessarily want to strike the comic note over and over and over. Even though an uh, Indian elephant is smaller than an African elephant, it was going to be a, an adolescent Indian elephant. So not that enormous creature. Nonetheless, it didn't, seem, it didn't fit right. And so then for the long, and I needed an animal that was Indian. So the second choice for me was a uh, rhinoceros. And I was very happy with the rhinoceros. In fact, I'm using the rhinoceros in my next novel when I just finished. Because every, all of you know what a rhinoceros is, right? But I bet none of you could tell me where they live exactly and which one has two horns and which one has one horn. So you know the rhinoceros, but you know nothing about them, which is very useful for a writer who's going to talk to you about rhinoceroses, because I can make you believe all kinds of things. Now, as a matter of fact, rhinoceroses, if you ever go to someone who has a rhinoceros, look at their eyes. They have particularly beautiful eyes. I don't know why, but like, why not have the longest eyelashes? You know, they should have a magazine. They have incredibly long eyelashes. They have gorgeous eyelashes. So I can exploit that and, and make you believe other things. So it's a very useful fictional animal, the rhinoceros. Unfortunately, the stupid animal doesn't eat meat. It's not a carnivore. And how do you have a carnivore survive in the Pacific? There's no grass in the Pacific. Grass doesn't grow on water. So I realized, and a lot of writing, and not writing, comes down to the technicalities. I needed an animal that eats meat. And so the default candidate after that, obviously, was the tiger, the largest carnivore in India. I initially wasn't very happy with that choice, because you all know what the tiger is. You all know what kind of looks like, you know what his habits. People are more familiar with tigers. It's used a lot in fiction. To me, it was a bit of a mundane animal. But I sort of felt I had no choice, and I uh, used it. As for symbolism, I'll very quickly... It's interesting, the, the work of fiction is that I come halfway, and you come halfway. Tell, the book is not like television, thankfully. Cinema and movies are pressed to you. They kidnap you for two hours, right? They give you images, they give you music. In case you're too dense to feel something, they have music to tell you what to feel. So in Jaws, just before the tiger comes, you have the cello. Right. Dun, 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 So your heart starts beating, so when so you're prepared, nearly prepared, and the shark comes up and your your hearts are beating. Cinema is highly, highly manipulative in the way it shocks, in the way the music is played, in the lighting, to tell you how to feel. Books don't do that. They're not as manipulative. You have to invest yourself. And that's why books often are more successful. If you make, if you give yourself, if you work hard enough, if you force yourself to read a book, which you should all do, you'll get more out of it than any movie ever. Because it involves yourself. Because there's only words on the page, and to make them come to life, you have to bring your own ideas to it. So, back to life by the writing method. Yes, some things are also symbolic. But less than you would think in my mind, because my concern was sort of like an engineer. Give me an example. The, the, the uh, Statue of Liberty in New York. The engineer for that was Gustave Eiffel, the man who designed the Eiffel Tower. He was the engineer. He didn't design the 
etc. He was the engineer. When he was asked to set it up, he had to make sure the thing didn't fall over, that her arm wouldn't fall off, that her head wouldn't fall, that she could resist wind and rain. Now, what she might mean to the boatfuls, the shipfuls of new immigrants to America, what she might mean to America was not his concern. He just had to make sure the statue of liberty did not fall over. He worked on the inside looking out. What Americans and foreigners would think of separately was not his concern. In a sense, when I wrote like the I was kind of the same. I just had to make sure that you believe the title. Which is why in part one I spent so much time discussing animal behavior, explaining territoriality. That all animals like us, including us, have a strong sense of territory. We all sense when our territory is invaded, our personal spaces. If someone comes up to you and is like, this close, it's like, whoa, you invaded my space. If someone comes in the middle of the night in your house, your father will get very upset. Um, we all have notions of territory, and that comes from the fact that we're animals. Um, I just had to make the tiger believable. It had to be, but what he might mean to you, in a sense, I mostly left to you. And so the interesting thing that happened is, I wrote this book that I felt had no success to. It talks about Zeus, it talks about religion, and most urban novel readers don't like God and don't like Zeus. So it was this very weird novel that I thought would have no one read. And bizarrely, it did very well, and I started having interactions with my companions today where I met readers. And readers started saying, you know, it is Richard Parker a standard for God. After all, we're afraid of God, like we're afraid of tigers, but Richard Parker brings comfort to Pi, like God comforts people who believe God. And other similarities. Um, and to be honest, my first reaction was like, God, I thought that. It seems really stupid. I wrote the book, but I didn't think of that. And so what happens in the next interaction I do is I say, well, you know, yes, of course Richard Parker would be a standard for God. And I sort of re-channeling to readers reactions that I got from other readers. In a sense, I was giving some other, someone else's imaginative reaction to my book back to other readers. Because in a sense, that's what you know, my job. What Richard Parker might symbolize, you have to decide. So for example, the meerkat. I can tell you, meerkat, from the eye, I remember this from the eye. There are meerkats. There is no symbolism in the meerkat. I just wanted a friendly, funny, gregarious animal that people would like, because I know people like the island we through it. So initially I had the idea of choosing mongooses, because mongooses are quite common shit pests. The problem is that mongooses are really vicious animals. Farmers hate them, they're very vicious. So I didn't want an animal that was vicious. I wanted a nice, friendly little animal. And the meerkat is that. It's a funny, friendly, weird little animal from Southern Africa. As far as I know, there's no deep symbolism in any religion or any belief system with the meerkat. <laughs> but if you believe there's some sort of deep symbolism to the meerkat, you run with that. So it's not my job to tell you how to react to work, you decide what you want to do with it. Does anyone else have a question? So, speaking of the island with the meerkats, I thought it was really interesting how Pi found a tooth and a flower. So, it's this concept of how the island destroys humans. So, what did that really mean to you? Like, why did you choose to incorporate the idea of the island? Such a cute, adorable little island being so destructive to humans specifically. Okay, the island, which is really done in the movie. Um, the island. Um, so, as I said, life requires a competition between two stories. Um, between sort of the animals and the thousand. I didn't want it to be an innocuous competition. I didn't want it to be a story between a man who has a cat and a man who has a dog. I wanted them to be qualitatively different. So, the narrative strategy I was pursuing in part one was to tell a story that was increasingly hard to believe. You know, when you first of all believe that a boy could survive in a life with a tiger for five minutes, well, because I knew all this stuff about territoriality, because the tiger is seasick and been knocked out by sedatives, um, you believe, you stay on board, you keep on reading. Great. Now, when you believe that, and this was on the movie, it's in the book, at one point, the tiger goes blind and Pi goes blind. And they meet, they bump into another lifeboat in the Pacific with another survivor who's also blind. I mean, how likely is that? Two blind people and two lifeboats bumping into each other in a large social planet. Well, because it has dialogue that scene and it has a surreal discussion about food, hopefully you stay on board. You say, well, this is getting weird, but you know, it's compelling, I'll keep on reading. What I was hoping would happen by the time you got to the 
I learned was that your rationality, don't forget this novel is all about faith and rationality and competition. Up to now you've suspended your disbelief, you have had faith in the story. I was hoping by the time you got to the island, your rationality would kick in. You would say, oh, this I can't believe. But, you know, there must be some deep symbolism I'm not understanding here. It's kind of weird, it sounds kind of interesting. I like weird gas. I'll keep on reading. That was my challenge with the island. I had to keep, I had to make sure you kept on reading. Then you got off the island with Pi, which you probably forgot to make, so I got to the second story. And I was hoping you'd be so repelled by the second story, which is unbelievably brutal. People always mention me about Savage that felt when a zebra was killed. And I'm thinking, wait a second, the second story, the guy's mother is killed, she's beheaded, and he has her head thrown at him. You know, that's horrific. It's horrific violence in that second story. Do you want to believe that one? Do you really want to believe that we can't do much better than kill ourselves when things get tough? Are we not capable of acts of generosity and heroism and all that? Hopefully you'll believe, you don't want to believe the horrific story, and you want to believe the first one. But, if you were going to believe the first story, I wanted to make it difficult. I wanted you to stop being so damn reasonable and make a leap of faith. And say to yourself, you know, what do I know about algae? There are carnivorous plants. You can fly trap, you can buy them in the flower shops in Toronto, you can eat little flies, you can close down and cuss them down that little land. Uh, what do you know about weird cats? You know, what do you know about the Pacific? Who here who hears across the Pacific? You know, so I want you to stop being rational and make that leap of faith and say, you know what, I'll believe the idea and be the better for it. For believing that story, be the better for it. Just as when you make any leap of faith, you will be the better for it ultimately. If you choose to love someone, you'll be better off for making that choice than not loving them. Even if that love doesn't work out, as I'm sure it will for some of you, you'll find a true love after a few not true loves. <laughs> you love this job that you don't love. You have to make those leaps of faith to be better for it. If you never make a leap of faith, you're going to have a very sad life. So I want you to make a leap of faith. So the island was that thing I wanted to float just beyond what you could reasonably believe. So you stop being rational, or overly rational, and make that leap of faith. And um, within it, I just threw things that I thought would be interesting. So the two, I wanted to be vicious. Because to me, the island, I wanted to have an appearance of security that that is not so good. So the good thing was what rationality is like. You know your iPhone? I'm sure many of you have iPhones. You love your iPhone. You'd rather have your iPhone than your parents on certain days, I'm sure. <laughs> Nonetheless, the iPhone is a trap. It is like the island. It seems so friendly, but actually it's carnivorous. It eats your social abilities. If you spend your entire life on your stupid iPhone, you're going to be a social nerd. Because really, life is about being there. It's about interacting with people. People you like, people you don't like. You can't choose life the way you choose it on a smartphone. You only listen and talk and text to people you like. Life is more adversarial than that. She's coming up. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, let's just continue on that note about not liking smartphones. Uh, thank you very much for having me.